connection made, the face of a cell fastened. The baby is buttoned up. The fairing goes on. Clamshell seal against Earth's atmosphere. Pea pod to be tossed aside in space. No more check and recheck. Uh, launch director to mission director. Mission director here. Uh, will you give me the mission status, please? The mission is go. Uh, Roger, thank you. Guidance control, steering checks are complete. The radar is preparing for guidance. Uh, Roger. Report BTL status. Uh, BTL's ready. Launch director, we have received clear to launch. Minus 50. Start remote camera number one. Started. Close blockhouse vent. Close. Console, start camera and mag tape recorders. Camera and mag tape on. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five, Open solo fuel four, vent. Three, two, one, zero. Dark. Plus is the main control room at Goonhilly Down, the point at which Telstar's first signals across the Atlantic will be received in the British Isles. All positions are manned. The brand new apparatus, all designed and built in this country from scratch in a few days over a year, about to face its first full-scale test. Every possible preliminary check has been made. And it's four and a half minutes to go. Here we are. Here we are. There's a bar. Now, we are anticipating... That's a man's face. There it is. There it is. That's the picture. You, s you see it for yourself. There it is. It's a man. Mr. Booth. Uh, Captain Booth looking anxiously at the quality. Delicate tuning to hold the toppling picture. There it is. They've got the frame hold right. Captain Booth still looking. 
worried at it. And it's held on the right-hand monitor, perhaps a little better than on the left-hand one. There's the unmistakable image. There is the first live television picture across the Atlantic with uh, rather less than four minutes of available time left. I don't know about you, I feel as though I'd fallen into the washing machine and come out through the mangle. Well, there you are. We said we were going to get the picture in this program if you killed us. It very nearly did kill us, but not quite. At least a fragment, a shaky picture of a man coming from the other side of the world. Now, I hope you think this has all been worthwhile. For that brief fragment of picture, I myself, having seen the beginnings of Eurovision itself, such a tiny thing it now seems, for myself I feel quite glad to have lasted long enough to see that fragment tonight. Welcome. Good morning, America. Bonjour, France. Good afternoon, Britain. Welcome to this event hosted by the IEE to, to mark the millennium milestone of the 40th anniversary of the successful launch of Telstar as a communications satellite for the public across the Atlantic. Welcome to you all both here and overseas. I would like to introduce to you this afternoon as our first speaker, Ben Vivian, who is the Chief Executive of British Telecom. Ben. Ladies and gentlemen, Madame et Messieurs, today is a day, as the commentator just said, about the future. It's about the future by looking back in admiration and in gratefulness to the people who made that possible. Today is all about people. People who against common belief had a commitment and a passion and made things happen that have really reshaped the world. People sometimes say, if you want to measure importance, look to what it does to people. What we are commemorating today has absolutely had an impact in everybody's life. So therefore I salute the brave men and women who 40 years ago had an idea, had a passion, and had the stubbornness to put it through, and had the ability around the world to create something that we rely on in our day-to-day -day life. It's well deserved that it is truly around the world. It's great that we have America, France, and the UK united in this program, and I would say thank you to the IEEE to make this possible because it was the first step that underlined that this world may be large but in ideas it is absolutely very very small when we reach out and touch. Thank you for coming and I would like to give the floor to the president of the IEEE. Ray. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you all today, some of the, with some of the people who had the original vision to make this all possible. On the 40th anniversary of the launch of the Telstar satellite, it's a thrill to stand on the site of the first live transatlantic satellite television broadcast between two continents, Europe and North America. This satellite Earth station here in Goonhilly Downs is one of the three historic ground stations involved with the satellite uh, Telstar. And with its open dish design, it has been a model for satellite television Earth stations throughout the world. Dedicating three milestones at the same time on two continents is a first 
for the IEEE. I congratulate the committee members from the IEEE UKRI section, as well as the IEEE members in Andover, Maine, and Plumeur, Bordeaux, France, for making Telstar's 40th anniversary, anniversary a truly memorable event. I also want to thank our friends from BT for their help and support in making this celebration possible. Coordinating the dedication of these sites as a milestone was a bit complicated for the organizers of the ceremony, but imagine the obstacles faced by the companies, by the agencies, by the people in developing and deploying the first Telstar. Imagine the obstacles faced by those attempting to coordinate the very first broadcasts by satellite across two continents and three countries in the early 1960s. There was no internet. There was no instant communication. No easy way as there is now to discuss the details. A privilege that most of us now take for granted. What there was, however, was a vision and a cadre of engineers and technical professionals dedicated to working together to realize a vision. The launch of the Telstar satellite marked the beginning of a major change in communication. Built on earlier concepts, satellite receivers opened up a new communications possibilities. And the live transatlantic television broadcasts and the subsequent advances in international communications opened up access to information to the world and helped plant the seeds for a more global society. The three words, live via satellite, which used to appear at the bottom of our television screens, heralded something special, something important, something momentous. Those three words invited us to experience important, relatively firsthand events we would not have been able to experience with that same immediacy prior to Telstar. Those words were a signal that the human family was being convened. Telstar gave us permission to share. And Telstar made us citizens of the world in a way we had not been before and we had not foreseen before. All of this would not have been accomplished without the commitment from AT&T Bell Labs, the British Post Office, the French National PPT, and the U.S. National Aeronautics and Space Administration to collaborate on the development of two active mobile communication satellites. All of this would not have been accomplished without the, con the contributions of a myriad of dedicated engineers and technical professionals in England, France, and the U.S. who worked for these organizations. These men and women helped to change the world Today, as we dedicate these milestones, we proudly honor these individuals, their accomplishments, and their vision. Many of you remember the early 1960s when it was an especially turbulent and exciting time. That certainly was the case for IEEE. Forty years ago, the IEEE was an idea about to launch. Many of the engineers who helped develop Telstar and these ground stations were members of the IEEE's predecessor societies, the IRE and the AIEE. Here in the UK, many were members of IEEE. Since the advent of Telstar in 1962 and the founding of the IEEE the next year, the IEEE has more than doubled in size. Today, we boast over 377,000 members in more than 150 countries and cover all of the disciplines of electrical, electronics, engineering, information technology, and communications. 9,000 of those IEEE members reside here in the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. Back then, there were only 600. We have become a global village. This growth is due in part to the explosion of interest in communications technologies 
that was spurred by the advances stimulated by Telstar. The launch of this satellite focused the world on the vision and the possibilities for the future of communication, and it helped to get us to where we are today. In the 19th century, the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer said, everyone takes the limits of his own vision for the limits of the world. Thanks to those engineers who had the vision to create Telstar and the skill to make those first broadcasts a reality, our vision of the world is without limits today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure and honor to be with you this afternoon. I'm Levant Onra, director of IEEE Region 8, which is Europe, Africa, and Middle East. We have about 50,000 members of IEEE in that large geographic region. Today, I'm not going to take much of your time, but I'd like to share my sincere feelings about this whole event. You know, the, the profession we call electrical engineering collectively, which includes electronics, all kinds of information theory, information sciences, computer sciences in general, and I'm sure there are many of them over here in the audience, I'm sure the majority is from that profession. Well, you have all the reasons to be proud of this profession. I personally enjoyed it very much in my life. If you look at the society, I think in this short lifetime of this profession, which is just maybe slightly over than 100 years old, we have collectively accomplished a lot. We changed the society over and over, not only once, but many, many times. And each time it was something more significant. There was a bigger impact than the previous ones. Now, many people, ordinary people throughout the world, utilize our accomplishments on a daily basis, continuously, and with a lot of ease. They just push a button, they see all the TV channels everywhere, they just push a few buttons and communicate everywhere in a mobile fashion, send SMS messages and many, many things else. It is all our achievements, and we should, we, we should be very, very happy and proud, and, and proud of ourselves. Now, of course it's a collective achievement, but some engineers contribute more to that profession. Now, looking at the badges over here today, I see a lot of, uh, a lot of 16, uh, 1962s written over there. I'd like to thank them personally, and also on behalf of IEEE Region 8, I'd like to extend my thanks. They did an excellent job 40 years ago over here. I'm sure they were aware of what they were doing at that time, but probably today, looking back 40 years before, probably they have another feeling right now, a feeling of accomplishment, feeling of happiness. Well, that accomplishment started locally here. But look at it again. It's shared globally everywhere. Today we have IEEE UKRI section over here with us who initiated the whole ceremony, the milestone event. I'd like to thank them personally. But we also have IEEE France section joining us remotely. They're also a part of Region 8. Thank you, IEEE France. And we have IEEE Maine from the other side of the Atlantic. I'd like to thank them as well. Well, I'd like to tell you something before I finish my words. The change in telecommunications is taking place every minute. Probably right now, there are new innovations all over the world. And video communications and visual communications is definitely improving at an enormous rate. Dealing with young engineers on my daily life, I know that they are also pretty much excited, and that excitement will bring us new innovations in the near future. We will see a completely new way of viewing objects remotely. Your TV sets will be completely different than what we see today. We can even talk about three-dimensional ghost-like light objects moving around us. They broadcast it remotely from some other places. There will be more interactive communications on a real-time basis with real human beings and ghost-like remote objects everywhere. Where well, I'm myself personally excited with all that stuff. Again, I'd like to thank you engineers making all that a reality. 
I'd like to thank British Telecom for hosting this nice event over here. Thank you all. On behalf of the UK and Republic of Ireland section, I want to thank everyone for their participation in this um, event. As um, section chair and now past section chair, it has been a great privilege for me to watch the plans for this milestone dedication unfold and to be with um, you today. I would like to um, thank those in the UK and Republic of Ireland section who researched the milestone and planned the event, particularly um, Ben Varajan, BT Group Chief Executive, John Davis, BT Wholesale Chief Operations Officer and Director of BT um, Wales, and Kelvin Ball, uh, Groonhilly um, Station Manager. History is important to the UK Republic of Ireland section and Groon Hilly is yet the latest of the milestones we have um, dedicated. In July 2000, the section dedicated the transatlantic cable station in County Kerry, Ireland and last December we commemorated the centennial of the first transatlantic wireless transmission from Poldhu. We are soon to dedicate another milestone, the Shannon Electrification Scheme in Ireland. This milestone, Grunhilly, reflects the courage of experimentation of new design based on sound engineering fundamentals. Designer John Bray wrote that the initial transmissions were a time of considerable tension. None of the complex equipment could be fully tested before Telstar first appeared over the horizon, and all this had to be done with millions of viewers waiting on both sides of the Atlantic. But it was done. We have come a very long way in television transmission in the 40 years since um, Telstar. To predict what might become common practice 40 years hence would be a challenge. We have already seen spectacular images of planets at the edge of our solar system. While not precisely live television in the sense that Telstar was, the satellite transmission technology derived from it continues that technological heritage. The recent Hubble telescope images take us to the edges of the universe. Groom Hilly Earth Station handled those transmissions. The open dish receiver design pioneered here continues to serve satellite ground stations reliably the world over. The antenna's nickname Arthur, an allusion to the round table it resembled, is appropriate. Malori referred to Arthur as Rex Quandum Textu Futuris, a king both past and future. Past and future meet here today. This is the Goonhilly Down radio station of the British Post Office calling America. Here you see the main control room which stands on the Lizard Peninsula, the most southerly point of the British Isles which juts out into the Atlantic Ocean toward you, just a few miles from the memorial marking the spot from which Marconi received the first transatlantic radio signal 60 years ago. Now, in this experimental transmission, we are attempting to send you the first transatlantic live television link from Britain to the United States via the space satellite. Tonight, this equipment, designed and built with the cooperation of British industry by the post office team you see manning their controls, tonight, this equipment received perfect pictures from Telstar, pictures which were fed direct to the television screens of millions of British homes.
Hello, and uh, welcome to France and England from Maine. And uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here on this great day. And I'd, I'd like to introduce the first speaker from the United States, Joel Snyder. He's the 2001 president of IEEE, and that fits because I was the 2001 Maine section chair. Here we go, Joel. to be here today at Andover, Maine, at this unique triple milestone. I'll be getting a lot of feedback. Okay, I hope we're back on the air again. This event is especially meaningful to me because it touches two areas of personal interest space and communications. When I was a teenager growing up in New York City, I lived, breathed, and dreamed space and radio. I haunted the New York Planetarium. I was there every weekend. I also built a radio receiver in my basement. I learned Morse code, but never got beyond the five words per minute required for a novice license. To this day, my hands don't work that fast. I did connect with ham radio operators throughout North America, throughout the U.S., and particularly the major cities in Europe, Paris and London to be particular, uh, I made many good friends via the airwaves there. It was truly exciting to communicate across the continents in real time, even if it was in code, and especially so because there was no other means of doing so. So you can imagine my enthusiasm when I learned that the IEEE was recognizing as electrical engineering milestones these engineering triumphs, the ground stations that sent the first transmissions of live tele television signals via satellite and across the Atlantic. For nearly 20 years, IEEE has honored significant achievements in the history of electrical, electronics, and computer engineering through the Milestones program. The ground stations here in Andover, and in Gunhilly Downs, England, and Premier Bordeaux, France, are the 44th, 45th, and 46th IEEE milestones to be named around the world. Today we pay tribute to the contributions of the people who made these stations work. Here in Maine, a dedicated crew of AT&T Bell Labs employees successfully built the first Earth station for active satellite communication. Their work and that of the engineers across the ocean demonstrated the possibilities of a global satellite system. Here with us today are several members of the original Andover team. People such as Bush Phillips, Percy Tripp, Dave White, Dave Bellinger, Carl Sedequist, Walter Brown, and others are all here today. Please join me in congratulating them for a job well done. And on behalf of everyone at the IEEE, I salute you and all the individuals who were involved in establishing this site and the sister sites in Europe. Thank you. <clears throat> the ground station in Andover took over a year to build. When Telstar was launched by NASA in July 10, 1962 from Cape Canaveral in Florida, the engineers at this site had to wait 15 hours for the satellite to reach their view. Telstar moved in an elliptical orbit, varying in height from 600 to 3,500 miles. It circled the Earth every two and a half hours. This meant that each period of transmission between the ground station was limited to about 30 minutes. It also meant that the ground station aerials with beam widths of less than a degree had to track the moving satellite with great precision. When the satellite finally appeared, a signal was sent from the ground station to the satellite which amplified it 10, 10 billion times and relayed it back to Andover. The team learned 16 minutes after the American flag at Andover appeared on their television screen that the twin ground station in France had received the same broadcast. This was truly an exciting moment in history. Telstar did more than bring live TV to people around the world. It also made worldwide telephone service possible and paved the way for communications industries, including cable television and international electronic data transfer. In fact, satellite communications captivated the world. 
I understand that the, even the Queen of England commented on the excitement, and this is a quote, excitement of communicating through a dot in space, end quote. The IEEE Milestone program reminds us, all of us, where we've been, and it inspires future engineers to continue working for a world where everyone benefits from technological breakthroughs. We honor the accomplishments of our colleagues today because they have advanced the human knowledge by opening communication to the world, and because of the ongoing work of engineers and scientists, I'm sure satellites will continue to be the source of important contributions for many generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. That was wonderful. Uh, our next speaker is Milton Punnett, uh, Bird Air Structures. And uh, Milton had a big part in uh, the ray dome itself and the materials and uh, did a wonderful job. And here's Milton. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Bonjour, mes amis. Plume Bordeaux. Hello to my friends in Plume Bordeaux, and hello to the folks in England. As you can tell, my French isn't too good. In 1962, I especially knew two words, too sweet, make it quick. <laughs> I personally appreciate having had the opportunity to work on the Telstar project, both here and at Plumer Bordeaux. It was a great engineering experience. I actually witnessed that first reception and enjoyed the celebration afterwards while working in France. When we first prepared our proposal to BTL for the radome, we knew our major competitor was Goodyear. You know the size of the Goodyear company. As a comparison, my employee number with Bird Air was 005. The 00 was added by our business manager who worried about the impression a plain number five would make upon our potential customers. Goodyear sent one of their famous blimps to Whippany, New Jersey to fly and give rides to the BTL executives. We sent Wally Bird to talk to the engineers. He told them we could build a structural joint in a new hypoline composite as strong as the material itself. Perhaps Goodyear made a tactical error and ignoring the engineers, as they apparently made the decision. But I would like to think the choice was made based upon technical considerations. I don't know if they noted that we had only succeeded in making such a joint in small samples in our laboratory. Its application on a large scale would take a big leap in faith. But then again, why should the radon be any different than Telstar? Several years ago, I read of the establishment of the Electrical Engineering Historical Milestones, which would be denoted by a plaque at the site of the achievement. The article mentioned how difficult it was in comparison to civil engineering, as usually there wasn't much to see. I could especially relate to this knowing that the antenna and radome here in Andover and one in Nova Scotia, Canada were being torn down. I truly felt a sense of remorse, which was somewhat relieved upon learning that the radome and antenna in France had become a museum. How would you feel knowing something you built was now a museum piece? In 1998, the museum directors were concerned about the life expectancy of their radome. We were subsequently commissioned to ascertain its condition. Upon visiting the site, their efforts impressed me so much that I sent a suggestion to the History Center that it would make an excellent candidate for the IAE to recognize. Not only was Telstar a true engineering achievement, 
there was still something to see in France. I later learned that the antenna England was also still there. So began the quest and the preparation of the nomination. Thank you. Thank you very much, Milton. That was uh, wonderful, and we thank you for uh, starting this milestone progress on this way. Our next speaker is Walter Brown, retired from Bell Labs, who was up here in Andover at uh, the very start of the project, and uh, I guess was prior to it, uh, worked a little bit in Cape Canaveral uh, before the launch. Walter. this milestone in communications history and this personal milestone in my career. I had been at Bell Labs for 10 years when I began working on the Telstar project in 1960. I was responsible for developing and placing instruments on the spacecraft that would measure its environment in space and the impact of that environment on the long-term reliability of communication satellites. One of the most exciting and rewarding aspects of Telstar, from my point of view, was the incredible level of commitment of Bell Laboratories staff, who really worked their buns off together to make it happen in less than two years. I think at least a third of all Bell Laboratories was directly involved in some way in the development and construction and testing of the satellite itself and the ground station here at Andover, and all of Bell Labs felt they were part of it, and so did AT&T, who was behind us 100%. Forty years ago, I was one of those here at Andover watching, waiting, holding our breath, hoping, yes, hoping, that Telstar would be a success. Then as Telstar came over the horizon and a command was given to turn it on, there was a whoop that filled the radome. It works. We'd done it. The speed with which Telstar was completed was remarkable, as is the speed of progress in communications technology since then. In 1962, we hadn't a clue that broadband and wireless communications would be available to individuals, or that long-distance fiber optic transmission was even possible. The transistor was only 15 years old, and it was unthinkable that millions of transistors could be placed on a single chip. And it was almost unthinkable on July 11, 1962, that an active satellite would transmit real-time television between the U.S. and Europe. Launching Telstar was about realizing a vision that pushed the limits of technology in its day. But think of how far communications technology has come since that time. Because of the pioneering work of Telstar, and the work of many others in the 40 years since then. Millions of people around the globe last week were able to watch Brazil defeat Germany in the 2002 World Cup soccer final in Yokohama, Japan, in real time. In 1962, soccer fans around the world could only read about Brazil defeating Czechoslovakia in Chile the day after the match. It's been an incredible 40 years of progress. We can only wonder what the next 40 years will bring. Thank you again. And now we, and now we go to the radome. Merci. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a pleasure to meet you today over the oceans and the channel. Let me say a few words in French. Lorsque le projet Telstar a été connu en France, il s'est trouvé des hommes ambitieux et courageux pour adhérer immédiatement à cette aventure. Parmi ceux-ci, je citerai Pierre Marzin, 
alors responsable du Centre national d'études des télécommunications français. Sous son impulsion, grâce à son dynamisme, à sa volonté tenace, la France a été un des acteurs de cette grande et belle aventure en faisant de la Bretagne une terre d'élection de l'industrie des télécommunications. Cette participation française n'était pas évidente. En effet, à cette époque, la France n'avait pas encore terminé sa reconstruction. Après les années difficiles de l'immédiate après-guerre, le pays avait dû abandonner ses conquêtes coloniales en Asie et à partir des années 60 en Afrique. En 61, le général de Gaulle venait d'être rappelé au pouvoir pour mettre un terme à la guerre d'Algérie et placer la France à sa juste place dans le concert des grandes nations. Le réseau télégraphique était satisfaisant. Par contre, l'usage du téléphone n'était guère répandu et le réseau était encore embryonnaire. Quant à la télévision, l'unique chaîne n'était pas encore captée dans tout le pays. Les préoccupations des Français étaient tout autres. 61, c'est encore les troubles en Algérie et en France. C'est le début du nouveau franc créé par le gouvernement pour juguler l'inflation qui ronge l'économie. Mais cette époque, c'est aussi celle d'un formidable renouveau. De partout monte un élan fantastique, comme monte la sève dans l'arbre au printemps. Les artistes, les jeunes surtout, bousculent les traditions, inventent des mots nouveaux, une nouvelle façon d'être, un nouveau et irrésistible désir de vivre. L'influence anglo-saxonne est flagrante, car de l'autre côté de l'Atlantique et de la Manche, il y a aussi une jeunesse qui innove, qui bouscule, qui crée le monde de demain. Le grand mérite d'un homme comme Pierre Marzin est d'avoir deviné cette évolution, de l'avoir anticipée et d'avoir donné à notre pays un outil moderne et performant, les télécommunications. Il fallait, je l'ai dit, du courage. Les résistances au changement étaient fortes. La vieille administration des PTT vivait encore au temps du télégraphe. Imaginer qu'un jour on pourrait s'entendre et se voir en direct était pour certains un rêve, pour d'autres encore une utopie. Et pourtant, pourtant cela s'est fait avec l'enthousiasme, la volonté et aussi la compétence des techniciens et des ingénieurs des PTT. Grâce aussi au soutien sans faille des responsables politiques, je dois citer le Premier ministre René Pleven et bien sûr le général de Gaulle, acquis tous les deux rapidement au projet et conscient que la France ne pouvait pas, ne devait pas être absente de cette grande aventure. C'est à eux aujourd'hui que nous devons rendre hommage. Je voudrais maintenant répondre à une question souvent posée et je suis sûr que nos amis de Gunhilly et d'Andover se la posent également. Pourquoi pleumeur Bedou La réponse est à la fois technique et administrative. Technique car n'oublions pas qu'à l'époque, ce n'était pas facile d'envoyer et de recevoir des ondes extrêmement faibles. Telstar, que vous voyez ici, était un satellite à défilement en orbite basse. Par conséquent, son passage utile était bref. Les conditions techniques exigeaient donc un site placé le plus près possible de l'Atlantique. L'autre raison était purement administrative. En effet, les PTT venaient d'installer à Lagnon, c'est-à-dire à quelques kilomètres de plumeur bodou une partie importante de leur centre de recherche. Il était donc logique de rapprocher le centre d'expérimentation par satellite des chercheurs qui travaillaient sur ce nouveau mode de transmission. Il est temps maintenant de passer la parole à notre ami Jean-Pierre Collin. Jean-Pierre était présent ici sous le Radome dans la nuit du, 11, du 10 au 11 juillet 62 et il a donc vécu cette aventure exceptionnelle de Telstar. Il va nous raconter à l'aide d'images d'archives et grâce à son talent de conteur cette belle aventure vue du côté français. Place aux images. 1962. Écoulé depuis la réception à Plumeur Baudou d'une image de télévision transmise par un satellite. En 1962 déjà, le besoin d'accroître la capacité des liaisons téléphoniques et télévisuelles se faisait sentir du point de vue national et international. Les communications téléphoniques Europe-États-Unis étaient établies par radio et seulement depuis 1956 par câble sous-marin et en nombre très limité. Quant à la télévision, il n'existait aucun moyen de la transmettre rapidement d'un continent à l'autre. Il fallait l'enregistrer et transporter la bande magnétique pour la relire à l'arrivée. 
Il n'existait aucun moyen d'effectuer le reportage direct d'un événement. Le satellite de télécommunication offrait une solution séduisante à ses multiples besoins. Le centre de télécommunication spatial de plomeur boudou fut édifié sous l'égide du Centre national d'études des télécommunications, placé sous la direction de Pierre Marzin, un enfant du pays. Cette installation devait permettre à la France de participer aux projets américains Telstar et Relais. La construction du centre fut elle-même un exploit technique remarquable. Commencé en octobre 1961, les travaux d'édification et d'équipement de la station furent terminés début juillet 62, soit neuf mois après. Ce délai record pour réaliser un travail aussi difficile dans un temps aussi court est le fruit des efforts de l'administration, de la collaboration exceptionnelle des entreprises concernées et naturellement des ingénieurs des Bell Labs américains. L'équipement le plus spectaculaire est sans conteste l'antenne cornée d'un poids de 340 tonnes associée à un tracker d'acquisition et à un tracker de précision. Elle permet de capter les signaux des satellites dont la trajectoire est visible depuis la station et de transmettre les signaux de téléphonie, de télévision et de données à grande vitesse. En juillet 1962, à 0h47, c'est une première mondiale. Les équipes de la station spatiale reçoivent à plomeur Baudou la première image transmise par le satellite Telstar 1 depuis la station d'Andover aux états unis L'exploit technique étonne le monde et même les deux techniciens chargés du repérage du satellite qui avaient parié un dollar au profit du plus rapide d'entre eux. Le dispositif d'acquisition automatique les devança et le dollar gagné par la machine reste collé dans un bâti témoin de cet exploit. Dès le 12 juillet, Plumeur Baudou transmet à son tour une émission de télévision de l'ORTF vers les états unis Le 23 juillet a lieu le premier programme de Mondiovision et le 19 octobre, le général de Gaulle, président de la République, inaugure officiellement le centre. Puis les échanges deviennent réguliers. En 1965, après les expériences menées avec les satellites à défilement Telstar et Relais, l'antenne cornée entre en exploitation régulière avec le premier satellite géostationnaire Early Bird. Elle restera opérationnelle jusqu'en 1985, puis en l'an 2000, le Radome sera classé monument historique par le ministre de la Culture. Auparavant, en 1991, un musée est créé sur le site pour accueillir les milliers de visiteurs passionnés par l'aventure des télécommunications et fascinés par le Radome et son antenne. Now, may I introduce the chairman of the French section of IEEE. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Victor, for giving us this marvelous opportunity today, celebrating the eve of the global village. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, as president of the IEEE France section, I am very pleased to welcome you all to this ceremony. I express my special greetings to our colleagues in Andover in the United States and Gon Healy in the United Kingdom who are with us thanks to Globecast. This meeting which commemorates the 40th anniversary of the first transat transatlantic transmission of TV signals between Ando Andover in the United States Gone Hilly in the United Kingdom and the Plumeur Bodo in France is very important for our community. It is the recognition of our pioneer common work done by Bell Labs, British and the French post offices of all the actors of this success, which has opened the way to a wide range of satellite applications such as TV broadcasting, telecommunications, mobile communications, earth observation, positioning systems, and many others to come, I hope. To cut short, I am deeply honored today to unveil this plate commemorating this fourth anniversary of the first 
transatlantic transmission of TV signals between the United States and France. And now, for uh, I pass for uh, Gon Healy. Uh, Victor, merci. C'est une expérience unique d'avoir l'opportunité uh, d'avoir une expérience que celui ensemble. Ladies and gentlemen. You just saw a unique experience in France. I think that, Ray, you and I are going to repeat Maintenant, that nous here ben in Gunhilly. Okay. Okay. The IEEE milestone in electrical engineering and computing, first transatlantic television signal via satellite 1962, if I may read it. On 11th July 1962, this site transmitted the first wide television signal across the Atlantic from This satellite earth station was designed and built by the British Post Office Engineering Department, known as Arthur of Knights of the Round Table fame. Its open dish design became a model for satellite television earth stations throughout the world, July 2002. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now I have the pleasure of introducing Mike Jaselowitz, director of the IEEE History Center. And it's very befitting that Mike unveils the plaque as uh, the History Center administers the Milestones program. And uh, here we have Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Brian. Members of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers main section, members of the IEEE France and UKRI sections, and honored guests around the globe, welcome. We have seen the France and UKRI plaques, but before I unveil the main plaque, it falls upon me to say a few words about the IEEE Milestone Program. It is a great honor to have been asked to participate in IEEE's first three-way dedication. The IEEE Milestones in Electrical Engineering and Computing Program formally began in 1984. Prior to that, we had occasionally agreed on an ad hoc basis to co-sponsor so-called landmarks of our two sister organizations, the American Society of Civil Engineers and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. These were in most cases concerned with early power generation. With the centennial celebrations of IEEE in 1984, it became clear that our technology was mature enough that we needed our own landmarks program, which we renamed Milestones because we chose not to recognize sites or structures or artifacts, although we mark such with plaques as a sign of public recognition, as you have seen, but we are honoring the achievements themselves. I think it is quite telling that two of the three first milestones approved in the very first batch of the program, in fact, their plaques rest not too far to the northeast from here, relatively speaking, in Maritime Canada, did not recognize technologies that can be linked to a single place. Rather, they recognize technologies that enable humanity to begin to transcend the natural limits of time and space. These were the landing of the first transatlantic telegraph cable in 1866 and the reception of the first transatlantic radio signal in 1901. Therefore, almost 20 years and almost 50 milestones later, it is fitting to be back in eastern North America, linked by our IEEE technologies to two sites in Europe to commemorate the first transatlantic television signal via satellite. IEEE milestones rest in the IEEE sections. These are the local IEEE geographical units. Although milestones honor historical achievements that are at least 25 years old, the purpose of the program is to enable the IEEE sections today to take pride in their profession and to demonstrate to their local community how engineers contributed to and continue to contribute to their own community as well as the entire world. I am therefore particularly gratified to be here in Maine where, as we've seen, the whole town has really pitched in 
to make this dedication possible. Yet at the same time, this dedication amply demonstrates that I2E milestones are a symbol for all communities around the globe of how electrical engineering, information technology, and computing have helped to build the modern world and bring people closer together. Therefore, I salute the engineers responsible for Telstar, for the ground stations, and for the first satellite communication, and I salute and thank the IEEE France section, the IEEE UKRI section, and especially my host, the IEEE Main section, for this wonderful dedication, and it is now my privilege to unveil the main plaque. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. That was wonderful. Uh, right now, we're inserting Louis Hall, uh, retired from New England Telephone, who's going to give a little bit of background on the Andover site uh, and Andover Telephone as it started. And uh, here we have Louis. Thank you, Louis. I am a, an Andoverite, probably the only one here. <laughs> and it, as you can see, a lot of the people uh, come here and they see our funny little stores and our funny little buildings, and some say there's a few funny people around here. But you know, after Labor Day, things change. The funny people disappear. <laughs> I started my telephone career in Andover in 1946. My father and mother bought the, the Andover Telephone Company, which was located, the switchboard net had his store over there. My brothers, Keith, Herschel, Steve, we all worked the switchboards and we worked put in telephones, we fixed lines, and the things I remember about it, we had one metallic circuit, which people know what a metallic circuit is here, I presume. It was an open wire circuit to run the Roxbury Pond. In the summer it had about 15 magneto phones on it. This was the number seven line. I went to work for New England Telephone Company in 1955 in Farmington. In the fall of 1960, the Rumford Telephone Office cut over from a common battery system to dial, and I transferred to Rumford. In the early 1960s, strange things started happening on the Roxbury Pond Road. It was in the spring of the year. There were snow banks on the ground. There were men seen climbing over the snow banks with cars parked side the road. There were surveyor's tapes hanging on trees alongside the road. Finally, AT&T announced it would build an earth station and put Andover on the map. After plans were put before the slack man, one of the slack men was known to be telling around town that property taxes would surely be cut in half on account of the site. AT&T had to go to the Andover Telephone Company, which was then owned by Allison Meisner, to request enough ground circuits to be used for the project. And Al Meisner could not provide what was needed, so he relinquished his area rights to New England Telephone Company. I wondered what would have happened if Al had just by God, I'll provide them circuits, but I need some help, and a lot of it. And I wonder what would have happened. But anyway, there was a cable line that would run from Rumford CO to the site. Many private line circuits were routed through the Rumford CO to various points around the northeast part of the country and further beyond. There was a steady stream of cement trucks going up through the north, day and night. Large cranes were in use to erect the radome at the cost of something like $300 per day to rent. The first radome had to be replaced with a permanent radome. While this process was being done, they had a heavy wet snowstorm, which puddled up on top of the radome, which had let the air out to 
to get it over easier. It had puddled up on the top. They didn't know what to do. I understand there was bullet shot from shotgun up through the middle of the top to let the water run out so they could get it up. The day the satellite was launched, launched, 18T Chairman Fred Capel, after the launch in Cape Kennedy, and after that he flew to the Lewiston Airport where he was taken by a limousine to the Andover site for the ceremony. During his flight, he called from the airplane to get him, and he got a bad circuit from somewhere and could not hear. I know from that time on all the circuits from the world to Rumford, which were on ON carrier, were tested weekly instead of monthly. <laughs> 15 KC equalized cable line was built from Andover site to Washington, D.C. for a backup circuit to be used if the satellite failed while Fred Capel was talking to President Johnson. Brothers Hirsch and Steve started their work for the AT&T at the site at Mike Stowell, and there's quite a few more. I can't think of all of them. So once in a while I like to reminisce about the old number seven line to Roxbury Pond. To our friends of Andover and Gunhilly. Le radome de Pleumorbodou et son antenne géante PB1 sont aujourd'hui un monument historique national. Non seulement notre nation a voulu les garder intacts, mais France Télécom, opérateur historique des télécommunications françaises, a souhaité donner à ce site de Pleumorbodou une valeur toute particulière en construisant juste à côté un grand musée consacré aux télécommunications. Vous en voyez ici quelques images. Avec 3000 mètres carrés de surface d'exposition, ce musée est unique au monde, comme le Radome maintenant. Consacré exclusivement aux télécoms, le musée retrace l'histoire des communications depuis le télégraphe optique de Claude Schapp, à l'époque de la naissance des États-Unis et de la Révolution française, jusqu'à Internet. Mais il évoque également le futur en présentant les recherches actuelles sur les télécommunications de demain. Avec 100 000 visiteurs chaque année, dont 20 000 élèves et étudiants pour lesquels des programmes spécifiques sont proposés, le musée offre une vision globale, pédagogique, interactive, ludique des télécommunications. On peut se demander pourquoi l'antenne Cornet et le Radome n'ont pas été détruits comme à Andover. Par sentimentalisme, certes pas. Le coût de fonctionnement du Radome, qui ne sert plus pour l'exploitation des télécommunications, est suffisamment élevé pour rejeter cette explication. En fait, la raison est toute simple. L'exploit technologique de 1962, dont le mérite revient essentiellement aux USA, est un bien commun de l'humanité. La France, qui a été associée étroitement à ce succès, a respecté ce symbole d'une étape si importante de notre histoire. La pose de la plaque commémorative par les responsables de l'I3E donne encore plus de prestige à ce monument. Je tiens ici à renouveler mes remerciements à l'I3E et à tous ceux qui ont œuvré pour cette réalisation. Je pense en particulier à notre ami Milton Pionet, que nous avons vu il n'y a pas si longtemps à Pleumorbodou et que nous avons eu le plaisir d'entendre il y a quelques minutes. Le musée de Pleumorbodou constitue pour son propriétaire, France Télécom, une vitrine corporate. Nous serons très heureux de vous y accueillir lors de votre prochain séjour en France. Je précise que nos guides parlent parfaitement anglais et que les deux spectacles présentés sous le radome existent également en version anglaise. Bienvenue à Pleumorbedou, bienvenue sous le radome et au musée des télécoms. And now we, we finally hand back to Gunhilly. Merci beaucoup et au revoir. Thank you to three sets of people. The IEE, the speakers, and all of you here today.
for commemorating this 40th anniversary. And for those of you interested, Arthur is still up and working today. Thank you for commemorating this 40th anniversary of the communications revolution of satellite television coming across the Atlantic. Secondly, to thank all the people who put in the hard work to make today possible. And, although they're not visible to us, to say thank you to Intelsat for the satellite time that they've given us for this afternoon, using something slightly more advanced than Telstar was. But finally, so that we should say thank you and recognise all the men and women and their skills and their effort and hard work that made Telstar a success and actually ensured that the world was brought much closer together as it is today. That's it. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Au revoir, France. Goodbye, everybody. My job was at Andover in western Maine, near the New Hampshire border. It's pretty rugged country. Hello, and uh, welcome back to Andover. We have our final speaker, Charlie Hoff, the manager of the Andover Earth Station, who has a few final comments for us. Here you go, Charlie. Ladies and gentlemen, Madame and Monsieur, first, my congratulations to everyone involved in making this event possible, and especially to the Telstar veterans that are here. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here today. Uh, unlike many of you, I wasn't even in school yet when Telstar was launched, but as a child of the space age, I watched in awe as men walked first in space and then on the surface of the moon. My children, by contrast, have grown up digital with computers and instant communications pretty much taken for granted. They can't conceive of a time when the words live via satellite signified something momentous or perhaps even something tragic. I know the children's interest in science and technology lives on, however. It's my pleasure to give occasional tours of Andover to groups of school children. And as I talk to them about signals and satellites and space, there are always interesting and insightful questions from my young audience. These questions show that children are still interested in engineering and technology. They just need to be exposed to it and be given an opportunity to see things, especially technical things, in a new way. By the same token, today's commemoration honors not only the specific event, Telstar, it also honors those scientists and engineers who saw things in a new way and translated that vision, that new way of seeing things, into the reality called Telstar. Uh, because of that, this IEEE milestone is more than just a plaque recognizing the past. It is also a guidepost which can help show the way for future generations of engineers, scientists, technicians, students, and all of our fellow citizens. Merci, au revoir, thank you, and good day. Uh, I believe we're going back to Le Ray Dome now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, before we play into our tapes at the end, I'd like to take one moment and thank our speakers. And I'd like all of our speakers to come up here and uh, just unveil, appropriate to the occasion, these little mementos. Uh, and there's a reason why all the boxes look the same, and I had to do it all at the same time. But uh, we really appreciate, appreciate it. Thank you very much, Joel, Mike, Milt, Louie, Charlie, and uh, Walter Brown. Walter Brown. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And I uh, hope you like your uh, coffee. And now it's on to our uh, play out of tapes. Thank you, France. Thank you, England. Goodbye.
August 12, 1960, an historic satellite communications experiment first proposed by scientist John Pierce was in final countdown. just when I had the basic idea, it was sometime prior to 1954. At that time, I was frequently asked to give talks on uh, space subjects. John Pierce is a professor of engineering at the California Institute of Technology. Before his retirement from Bell Laboratories in 1971, Pierce was a research scientist and administrator whose chief work was in electron devices microwaves, and various aspects of communication. He also wrote science fiction under the pseudonym J.J. Coupling. Science fiction writer Arthur Clarke had proposed communication satellites as early as 1945. Without knowing of Clarke's proposal, Pierce began discussing communication satellites in 1954, three years before any satellite was launched. At the time, he was preparing a scientific paper for a meeting of the Institute of Radio Engineers. When I look back over my notebooks in late 1954, I find out that I was making entries about satellites on August 9th. And then I was calculating how much power would be reflected from a metallized uh, balloon. And I continued to think about satellite communication off and on. But for a while, in no very pressing manner because no satellites had yet been launched. It was only when uh, the Russian satellite Sputnik went up late in 1957 and uh, the first American satellite early the next year that I began to stir around and push for the launching of a, an American communication satellite. The large metallized balloon Pierce had speculated on in 1954 was available by 1958. NASA had made one for atmospheric studies. At an Air Force meeting, Pierce argued for using the orbiting balloon to reflect signals between the east and the west coast. The east coast terminal, including a large horn antenna and sensitive receiver, would be built at Bell Laboratories in Holmdel, New Jersey. Scientists at the California Institute of Technology agreed to send and receive signals from facilities at Goldstone, California. The effort became known as Project ECHO. At Bell Labs, research scientist Rudolf Kompner and project engineer William Jakes brought together resources and people. Transmitting and receiving equipment designed at Bell Labs was developed in cooperation with Western Electric, NASA, Caltech, and other organizations. Hello, Goldstone. This is Holmdel calling. Calling Goldstone. How do you read me? Homedale, this is Goldstone. You can start the tape if you want. Start, the, uh, Phil, start your modulation tape. This is President Eisenhower speaking. It is a great personal satisfaction to participate in this first experiment in communications involving the use of the satellite balloon known as ECHO. Project ECHO proved a number of things. It proved that you could uh, communicate by voice across the country by means of a satellite. It proved uh, that you could use very sophisticated uh, receiving equipment reliably. Uh, the receiver was a Ruby Maser, and it was the receiver that later enabled Penzias and Wilson to do their Nobel Prize work. It proved that uh, you could send uh, pictures by satellite facsimile uh, pictures. It convinced people that this wasn't a wild dream. And the next reasonable stage seemed to be uh, to launch an active satellite. An active satellite receives, amplifies, and rebroadcasts communication signals. Calculations of the power needed by an active satellite had been made by Pierce in 1955. Telstar-1, the embodiment of this idea, was being readied for launch into space by the summer of 1962, less than two years after the ECHO experiment. Funded entirely by the Bell system and under the direction of E.F. O'Neill, 
Project Telstar required hundreds of Bell Labs people. The most up-to-date technology was used. Guidance systems, traveling wave tubes, a scaled-up horn antenna, microwave transmission, and solid-state devices. Launch date was set for July 10th. Well, my feelings on the launch day of Telstar uh, were that this was just going to go. The Bell system had gathered notables at various uh, locations and uh, telling them that they were about uh, to participate in a demonstration of satellite communication. And uh, some of the notables, and I'm sure that a lot of the newsmen, were skeptical. They didn't believe that things could be built with such care that you just shot them up and uh, they work. Mr. Vice President, this is Fred Campbell calling from the Earth Station at Andover, Maine. The call is being relayed through our Telstar satellite, as I am sure you know. How do you hear me? You're coming through nicely, Mr. Campbell. Well, that's wonderful. Since you're all... I understand that part of today's press conference is being relayed by the Telstar Communications Satellite to viewers across the Atlantic, and uh, this is another indication of the extraordinary world in which we live. So we're glad to participate in this operation developed by private industry, launched by government in uh, admirable cooperation. Telstar worked just admirably and transmitted signals in the very first pass over the Earth. The first uh, transoceanic uh, transmission of television by Telstar was an entirely new thing. You La you saw things in distant parts of the world for the very first time in real time. Satellites made it possible to communicate to very remote areas where you couldn't afford to lay a cable or even to put in extensive uh, land networks. But above all, it caught the uh, imagination of people. And here was something about space that was clearly of actual day-to-day -day use and benefit to ordinary people everywhere, to almost everyone. And the invention of the solar battery at the uh, Bell Laboratories was absolutely essential uh, to the success of Telstar and other early communication satellites. But above all, the solid-state art was progressing since the invention of the transistor at Bell Laboratories, it would have been inconceivable to put into a satellite such as Telstar the complexity that it had using vacuum tubes. Today, many satellites are serving communication needs around the world, and more are planned. At Bell Laboratories, research to improve the capacity of satellite systems and reduce the size and cost of ground stations is continuing. For example, Instead of blanketing the entire United States with a broad beam, the scanning spot beam satellite would use narrow, concentrated beams moving from one small Earth station to another. To my mind, satellites came from three sources, from an interest in space engendered by science fiction, from actual space activities, and from an interest in communication. When I first thought of satellites and promoted them, I thought they were a good idea. I didn't know how good an idea, but you just uh, can't hold a good idea back. And there's another thing. You can't tell how good an idea is until you've tried it. Uh -huh. 